Hi, everyone. Hey, thank you so much for joining me this weekend. I am so grateful for this opportunity to connect with you online, whether you're joining me on Facebook or YouTube. I appreciate it so much, and um, I hope that you are doing well. I just want you to know um, I won't make any references to the election as of this recording. There's been nothing official announced, and so uh, I just want you to know that if you say, why didn't he say something? Um, it's because I am recording this before any of that, uh, you know, all was finalized. But um, I want you to know, I have been praying for you. I've been praying for you as, as internet friends, as uh, a church. I've been praying for us as Americans that, uh, and I, I tell you, I've been praying praying for both of the candidates that whoever God places in that position, that we'll pray for him and that he will look to God for guidance and help in leading our country. So I just want you to know that uh, that so that I don't I won't be saying anything but uh, about the election, but um, that's it. I probably wouldn't have said a whole lot anyway. But um, hey, you know, back during Easter, I overheard some some people talking about Jesus. Seems appropriate around Easter time. And they were talking about things that Jesus said. And what was interesting was that they said a bunch of stuff that Jesus didn't say. In fact, there was one statement that Jesus sort of said. But And I mean, it wasn't bad things. They were saying like, well, you know what Jesus said, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And of course, Jesus never said that. Um, for some of you, that was maybe some news to you. But um, um, there was a lot of things. But you know, something happened during this whole election process that really made me sad. I was driving along and I saw the coolest sign. Um, I don't put political signs up. I never have. My parents never have that I can ever remember. And uh, but so that's not really my style. But I saw this. I saw this sign that I thought was based on 1 Corinthians 13. The very last verse of 1 Corinthians 13 says, and now abides faith, hope, love. Some of you put that in your wedding, right? But the greatest of these is love. And there was a sign basically saying, I choose faith, I choose hope, I choose love. And I just thought it was so great. In fact, here's the sign right here. And as you can see, it's such a great sign. And it doesn't have a candidate on it. And which I loved that, you know, it was really just really more of a of a spiritual emphasis. And so um, so I thought I want to find out how to get one of these signs because I want to say, hey, I am for you know faith, hope and love. And uh, even the messages Andy Stanley shared. And I hope you enjoyed those. Um, they were really emphasizing that whole idea of unconditional love for each other. So as I was. Um, as I was looking, I went to, to the page, the Facebook page of this organization, and I have to just be honest with you, um, there was no <laughs> faith, hope, or love on there. Uh, it was basically, uh, you know, a We Hate Donald Trump website. Now, I've seen plenty of those, and uh, I'm not even saying that I blame them, because there's a lot of people who have legitimate reasons for not liking our president and so forth, but um, that wasn't really the issue that bothered me. Um, they had a series of signs that they called His Words Matter. The His was actually referring to Jesus. And what they did was they took a sign. It was very clever. They took a sign, and on one side of it, they had a picture of Jesus and a statement. Uh, well, in every case, let me just say, it was a, a misquoted or half-quoted statement of Jesus, and it was very much used out of context. On the other side was a picture of Donald Trump and a statement that he made. And frankly, none of the statements he made were very nice, so they had obviously pulled those out. But, but the Bible verse and the context of it, they really twisted that out of shape. Now, I didn't mind who, I didn't really care who they were voting for, but I do love the Bible and I do love Jesus, so I thought I would send them a message. I thought it was some kind of Christian organization. So I sent them a message. I said, you know, there's a lot of other verses that you could use because these are kind of being taken out of context. Well, and this isn't a political statement, but all of that hatred that they were kind of focusing on Donald Trump, I think they unleashed on me because um, they were not friendly at all. And I tried to explain to them really rationally. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I'm a pastor. I love Jesus. I'm a Christian, whatever. And uh, they obviously weren't, still weren't going to be convinced and they weren't happy and accused me of all kinds of things. So I had to bow out. It was really sad for me because, um, again, I didn't care who they voted for. But what I really cared for is those words of Jesus. I love the words that he spoke. But you know, there's a lot of things that people say that Jesus said that he never did say. And so that's really going to be this just next few weeks. What we're going to look at is some statements we think that Jesus may have said or feel like he should have said, but didn't. And, um, and today we're going to talk about one of those. Um, 
this again, I, 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 that's, that illustration I gave wasn't at all meant to be political because I'm really focusing on how do we look at who Jesus is and what he said. Um, today, as we start this new series, we are going to talk about, again, some things that Maybe we kind of picture Jesus saying, I've heard people say, well, you know, Jesus said this, Jesus said that, Jesus said, don't ever judge. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus did not say don't judge. In fact, he said, judge righteous judgment. That's just one. We're not going to talk about that one today. But um, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, we looked at a series, it feels like forever ago. I did a series that where we looked at Jesus and his own words. Um, and we looked at things like analogies that he gave about himself. He, he called himself the, the bread of life, the, the light of the world. Jesus called himself the door to salvation. He called himself the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He called himself the resurrection and the life. And there were a number of these. Remember, I think we looked at seven different statements that Jesus made. The true vine, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus said all of those things, and those were real statements that Jesus made about himself. But there are many things that people say that he simply didn't say. Now, it doesn't make them necessarily bad. Again, I just want you to, to clarify that. It just simply makes them things that God, Jesus, did not say. I, I heard one time somebody say, um, in fact, this wasn't that long ago. Somebody says, well, you know what? You know, the Bible says cleanliness, cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> and and um, the Bible doesn't say that, by the way. But hey, during this pandemic, still wash your hands for 20 seconds, right? Do all of that. And so, um, you know, it's not in the Bible, but it sure is, a, you know, a good guideline. But I hope that um, as we look at this, that this, is, this will be a help and an encouragement to you. And today I want to begin with some happiness. After all, I mean, God wants us all to be happy no matter what. If bottom line, no matter what, God wants us to be happy, right? I mean, even Solomon, who was called the wisest man who ever lived, you know, except for Jesus, of course, um, he said this in Ecclesiastes 3.12. He said, so I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. Well, that sounds great, right? That sounds like the American dream. God just wants me to be happy. And, you know, we're living in a society, we're living in a world that's really a, um, in fact, a new phrase, right? You do you. Um, kind of world where we want to do what makes us happy and that's really our first responsibility. It's the most common explanation that I get. Uh, it's also the most common excuse that I get for people doing things that maybe <laughs> they shouldn't be doing. They just say, hey, it's, you know, it makes me happy and God wants me happy, right? So there it is. There are TV preachers who who I was going to say are selling, literally selling, that God wants everybody to be healthy. He wants everybody to be wealthy. He wants everybody to be happy. And let me just tell you, that's not always the case, okay? In fact, it's not true at all. Our fairy tales say everybody lived how happily ever after. Now, let me just say right off the bat, we do serve a loving God and God even plans to bless us. He has a future for us. He wants to give us hope. And, and, and the fact is, is that when what we're going to talk about is so much deeper. But we tend to interpret all of that as, you know, God is good and happiness is good. So God must want me to figure out how to be happy. And there it is. But what if happiness isn't the best goal? What if happiness isn't the best advice to follow? See, it turns out that, again, Jesus never actually said be happy. You need to be happy. Pursue happiness. He, he actually never said that. Jesus never says, I want you to be happy at all costs. He never, ever said that. But hang on, because what he did say to us is so much better, so much bigger than that. Now, it, let me just say, if that were true, if God's saying, hey, just pursue happiness, do whatever makes you happy, whatever, I would be happy to tell you that, okay? <laughs> um, I would be, I'd be, be very joyful to be the person who says, guess what? God just wants you to be happy, and you're going to be happy all the time. So, But it's not true. And I have been committed over these months online to tell you the truth, okay? So here's the problem. When we start believing that God wants us happy above all else and at any cost, when we start believing that, it takes us down a road of other false beliefs. See, when we believe that above all else, God wants us happy, suddenly we're forced to 
to really believe that God exists to serve us, and that's not true. I mean, we exist to serve God. We exist to, because, at God's pleasure. And if, and if God is here to make us happy, then suddenly here he is, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all, um, you know, the holy one. He kind of gets reduced down to just this cosmic vending machine. So we, you know, we say our prayers and we push the button. And, you know, so, you know, I go, OK, D3, I should push that button and I should get what I want, uh, you know, a new car or a new job or my boyfriend or my girlfriend back or whatever you happen to be pushing the button of prayer for. <laughs> you know, I've, I've done my part, so God better do his part. Right. But when we believe that the bottom line for us is happiness, it radically changes our attitude toward God. See, we get to where one day when we're not happy, we simply come to this conclusion, and that's this. If God wants me happy, and I'm not, then God failed. See, that's why people say, oh, you know, I tried religion, you know, and it just didn't work for me. Yeah, I went to church for a while and all that, and I tried God, but it just didn't make me happy. And so either God isn't real, and that's what some people opt to believe. Uh, well, obviously, he didn't make me happy enough, so God doesn't exist. Or, uh, you know, he didn't do his job, so, hey, forget God. He let me down, so I'm, you know, I'm out. Um, I mean, this is so driven into us. It's even in our declaration of independence. You know, the whole, we hold these truths to be self-evident. So, so that's, they seem self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, they are created equal before God. But hey, people are sure not treated equally, are they? We've really had emphasis on that in recent days and months. But it says, but they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Well, what are these unalienable rights that God supposedly has given us in, you know, Declaration of Independence? That among, amongst these are the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as totally unpatriotic as this might sound, God doesn't promise you those things. <laughs> it says that our creator gave us these unalienable rights, uh, let me just tell you, um, if you're talking about here on earth, see, we are promised eternal life. If we trust in Christ and we accept him as our Savior, we are, we are promised eternal life in him if we trust him, but not necessarily a long life, not necessarily a happy life, you know, while we're here on earth. Life, liberty. You know, God does say that we can have spiritual freedom when Christ is our Savior, but then that doesn't guarantee that we're going to enjoy freedoms here on earth. Um, you know, I mean, I, there are people in other countries who are not enjoying freedoms. There are people who've served in our military who have been captured and put in prison and, and you know, become slaves of, of a sort. And uh, they're not they're not enjoying their freedom. So this life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Now, I guess we all get the we all get the opportunity to pursue happiness. But then we kind of all try to interpret that in different ways. What does that really mean now? Before you get all depressed and say, well, thanks a lot, David, to find out, you know, that God doesn't want me happy. Let me just say, God delights in your happiness. He likes it when you're happy. I think when you, it's kind of like with our kids. We like when our kids are happy, not unconditionally. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But, uh, but just like a parent enjoys watching their children happy, God delights in watching us happy. But what happens was, is in our pursuit for that happiness, in that focus, in that constant, like, hey, at all costs, we're going to be happy. There's something that happens. It seems right to us. It seems like that's really the direction we should go. And as even patriotic as it might sound, that we, you know, pursuit of happiness, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. See, there are beliefs that seem right and feel right, but may be false. And so let's talk about this. When we talk about the pursuit of happiness, you know, it seems right. But um, the first point I want to make here is, is that we have to come face to face, face with truth. What is truth? So without a belief in absolute truth, truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. Um, I hear Christians sometimes criticized, and if you're not a Christian, maybe you've, maybe you've felt this way, but I've heard Christians criticized that, they're, that they uh, are not scientific you know, um, that we have faith, so we reject science. And let me just tell you, 
That couldn't be further from the truth. When we hear science and we hear something wonderful, we just say, oh, that's how God does that. Uh, and so uh, we love science. Science is great. Nothing could be further from the truth of, you know, Christians just ditching science. But the problem really is, is that we live in a world where these, these two oppositional ways of thinking, these kind of philosophies, one is called relativism and the other is called subjectivism. And, and relativism, it's, what is it? It's, it's really the belief, the, the assumption that there is no such thing as absolute truth. That's what relativism. Truth isn't a constant. Truth, ch- truth evolves, uh, or maybe devolves, depending on your perspective. But you know, what used to be wrong isn't wrong anymore, or what used to be right might be wrong now. And so that's what relativism really is. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Then there's subjectivism, and that's very prevalent in our society as well. And that's saying, you know, I, the the subject have the right to determine what is right and what is wrong without submitting my judgment to to any authority outside of myself. I am the final authority. So I will determine what's right, what's wrong, and you might say, yeah, but you're doing that what's right or wrong for me. Eh, well, you know, that's all looking at focusing on happiness. So don't impose your truth on me. I've had people sometimes when I've shared, you know, uh, about Jesus with them or it's shared about God with them. They'll go, David, I'm glad that you that works for you. You know, um, It might be right for you, but it's not right for me and so forth. So without a belief in absolute truth, truth is defined, and very simply, of course, by whatever makes me happy. Now, some of you who are intellectual, you say, no, it's not what makes me happy, it's what makes sense. Okay, well, however you want to define it, but it really leads us to that next belief, and that's number two. When the bottom line is my happiness, happiness becomes the standard by which I judge my actions. So if 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 my wife isn't making me happy, then there's this girl at work that's making me happy. Well, I'll justify, you know, just whatever I've got to do to make myself happy. Oh, yeah, it might not be right by others, but by me, I'm making myself happy. So I pursue that. It allows me to justify whatever I do in pursuit of happiness. And that's the bottom line, which then leads us to to point number three, and that's this. Whatever makes me happy must be right. (laughs) Again, going back to that, if there's there's no such thing as absolute truth, then then whatever makes me happy must be truth, and it must be right. Um, It's like the old Sheryl Crow. I was going to Oh, uh, Sheryl Crow. Wow, 19, what, 1996? <laughs> okay, I'm old. Yes, I am. But remember, she wrote that song that says, um, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. So uh, there it is, right there in a song. If it makes you happy, then it's got to be okay. It, you know, which, which then leads us to this next statement, and that is this. Since, since we would conclude, since God wants me happy, anything that doesn't make me happy must be bad. That makes that would make sense, wouldn't it? You know, if 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 God's bottom line is David, you've got to be happy. Then if there's anything that gets in the way of that, then that's bad, and we need to get rid of it. <laughs> and as I go down this path of rationalization, it leads me to believe that then, think about it: discomfort, uh, delay, suffering. Uh, inconveniences, um, obstacles, pain, whatever it is, all of that can't be God's will. It can't be because it's not making me happy. Those are obstacles to my suffering, my pain, my agony, my discord, all of these things, you know. And if anything that doesn't bring me happiness isn't God's will, then before long as I walk down what seems to be and feels right in this pursuit of my happiness, the last statement I want to make is this. Without knowing it, I'm going to use a spiritual word here. Without knowing, I begin to worship the false gods of comfort, the false gods of money, the false gods of pleasure, of just, of things. Why? Because of a statement that we think that Jesus made, but didn't make. And that's that, you know, hey, bottom line, God wants you to be happy. Above all else, God wants you to be happy. Now, Jesus did say that he came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. But Jesus also did say that, hey, in this world, you're going to have some tribulations. So, um, again, this is kind of countercultural. Most of us have been taught, you know, maybe even in church that, hey, come to Jesus and he'll make you happy. Um, It's bigger than that. And let me just say, hold on, because it's better than that. 
So please don't under, misunderstand me. God does want us to experience more than happiness. In fact, Psalm 32, 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. See, that's that's not depressing at all, okay? That's good stuff. Um, and as our Heavenly Father, God, wants us to he experience all of that peace and joy, he wants us to have happiness, you know, from that standpoint, but certainly not above all else. And there are specific situations, specific circumstances, in fact, specific areas in which God says, no, I really don't want you to be happy in that area. I don't want you to be happy in these circumstances. And we're going to look at just three of them today. When doesn't God want you to be happy? I bet you've never heard a message, you know, with that, right? <laughs> when, God, when does God want, no, I'm not saying when does God want you miserable, okay? Don't, don't misinterpret that. But hey, there are some times when if you're happy in this situation, God's not too happy. For example, God doesn't want you happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise. See, God doesn't want you to be happy when it causes you to do, do something that's sinful or something stupid. Uh, we're going, you know, we're going through life, you know, we, this is so much fun, yay, this is ma- making me happy, and we think that whatever it is that we, you know, think is bringing us happy, happiness, we think, hey, live for the moment, right? You only live once, live for the moment, live for the now, um, and, you know, you do you, right? But here's the deal, what many times we think brings happiness to us in a moment can bring us misery and even destruction later on. Now, the Bible's really clear that there is pleasure in even doing wrong things. He's, this, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin uh, for a season. <laughs> it doesn't last, and that is, the, that is the problem, isn't it? God doesn't want us happy when we're doing something that we may enjoy in the moment, but that's going to hurt us, that's going to bring pain, that's going to be dis- destruction later. Listen, God does delight when we enjoy the great things that he has given to us. In fact, James 1.17 talks about how Every good and perfect gift that that God gives is from above. Everything that we enjoy, God has given to us. But when we step out of his direction for our lives in pursuit of of just fleeting happiness, that that is never God's highest. That's never God's best. I want you to know I don't come on here week after week so that you can enjoy a mediocre life. I really don't. I think God's got something far more wonderful for all of us. And scripture is very clear. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But just as he who called you is happy, so be happy in all you do. Oops. Well, I actually misread that, didn't I? It actually says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. You're saying, oh, great. God's perfect, so I have to be perfect. Let me just tell you. God wants to live his holiness inside of you. This isn't something about willpower. This isn't, you know, just put your knuckles to the grindstone, just keep going. No, no, no. This is, hey, God wants to love you, in you, through you. And so that's that's so crucial for us to understand that. We'd like it to, you know, read, yeah, hey, be happy. God's happy, so us, let's all be happy no matter what. But since that's what many people believe, um, just know, happiness does not exceed holiness. In God's perspective, I was talking to a husband uh, of a couple uh, that I married uh, recently, and um, I married them many years ago. And I said, hey, how are you guys doing? How's the family? And I said, hey, is, is your wife here with you? And he got this really embarrassed look, and I didn't say that to embarrass him, but um, <clears throat> he said, well, actually, we're divorced. And um, and my heart just sank because I I've seen what divorce can do and the pain that it can cause and so uh, and how painful it is. And I just said, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I said, you know, what happened? And he said, well, you know, how it goes. You know, we, we just weren't happy. Now, I was expecting him to give me some kind of dramatic story to tell you the truth. But he says, well, you know, just after a while, we just weren't happy. And, and, I, and I have listened, I thought, and, and I've heard this a million times, you know, um, we just weren't happy. We just weren't happy. We were just weren't happy. And in my heart, I didn't say this to him, but in my heart, I wanted to say, hey, you remember that part in your ceremony where it talked about, you know, sickness or in health, richer or poorer, you know, good times and bad times and all that, you know, um, you know, I just wanted to tell him, you know, unhappy happens. 
sometimes, okay? <laughs> Unhappy happens. And just, you know, sometimes it's just hanging there. And I've talked to many people who said, wow, I jumped out too quick. I was just, you know, we were going through a rough patch, and I just thought, man, I don't feel happy. And so, but... I asked, you know, him if he was happy now, and he assured me that he wasn't, and uh, that made me even more sad. But, and by the way, my point in sharing that story isn't to make some of you feel bad, feel guilty, or in any way. I know some of you have gone through the pain of divorce, and maybe you say, hey, I, we divorced for exactly the same reason you just, you just said. Um, I'm trying to show you that what, when we believe that, that happiness, constant you know, happiness is the bottom line, that thinking can give us permission to make, I don't know, decisions that we'll later regret. If doing this makes me happy, then even though it's wrong, then it's got to be okay because that's what God wants, isn't it? You know, um, it, the truth is there's a lot of things. You know, it's like, hey, I could walk in right now and say, okay, I shouldn't eat that cake. That you know, but but that cake makes me happy, right? <laughs> so if I eat the entire cake, um, and I wish there was cake, there is, is no cake, but. <laughs> But you eat it, eat it, eat it, you know, and, and later you go, what did I do? What did I do? You know, you go to the store or you're shopping online. Boy, this is crazy with all of us being pent, you know, up in our houses, you know, going online shopping. Have you had this experience where you've been clicking around and all of a sudden you see something that you didn't know you needed? Uh, you didn't know you needed it, but now that you've clicked on it, you see it. Now you know you need it. And, and you're already trying to pay off all of the things that you saw before that you didn't know that you need, that then you needed, and then you bought, right? <laughs> and it's fury. Why? Because it's going to make you happy. And the sad thing is, is we buy things that we don't need to, to impress people, you know, that we don't even like. And so uh, the truth is, is that we are so geared to focus on the moment. Now, some of you, perhaps I mentioned that, and you say, wow, yeah, we're in financial bondage right now because of that very thing, thinking, wow, something's going to make me happy. Um, you know, some, you know I, I, we're in debt, but boy, that one extra thing, that one extra gadget or whatever, just is going to really, you know, I'm going to really enjoy that. Um, here's the thing. It's, it's easy, as I mentioned, you know, worshiping at the altar of happiness, but since I'm not happy. If that's where I find myself, if I say I'm, you know, I'm not happy, what I'm allowing is I'm allowing myself sometimes to do something that really is wrong, that otherwise I would say don't do. In fact, it might be even something that I would advise somebody else not to do, but I'm justifying it. If it makes me happy, it gives me permission to do something that otherwise would be wrong. God doesn't want you happy when it causes you to do something that would be sinful. Or unwise. The second circumstance, the section, situation, God doesn't want you happy when it's only based on things in this world. He doesn't want us happy when it's just about stuff. You know, watch, watch late night TV, you know, uh, and you'll find out that you can't be happy without an ab cruncher, a 110-piece knife set, a sham wow, a clapper, and, um, and then one of those blankets that has the arms that you can put yourself through, right? You, you need all of that to, to really be happy. And um, wow, the, the, the craziness in our actions, many times we just get sucked in. We're, wow, that will make me happy. Our actions say this is our belief in this. There's a kind of a formula. Uh, we don't say this out loud. But what I'm going to pl display here and what I'm going to share with you, I think this is where what we really do believe, practically speaking. Again, we wouldn't say this. We wouldn't, you know, make a plaque out of this. But it's kind of like this. We kind of feel like better possessions plus peaceful circumstances plus thrilling experiences plus right relationships plus perfect appearance, got to throw that in there, equals happiness. You know, better, better possessions, whatever is the newest, whatever fancier, whatever faster, whatever bigger, you know, or smaller, as the case might be, whatever it is, if I get, you know, if I get that, I'm going to be happy. Or what about, you know, perfect circumstances? Can't have any conflict. If I don't like my job, you know, then, hey, or there's a little bit of tension. I've seen people quit their jobs just over a little bit of work tension. I mean, we all experience that. You know, I'm going to quit this. You know, my boss was my boss spoke mean to me, and so that's it. I'm out. But 
thrilling experiences, you know. That, isn't that what it really is a bit? I see people just trying to cram in as much fun and experiences, you know, whatever it is, the vacation of the month or whatever. And I know even during this pandemic, it's been tough. But right relationships, and we look at those and we want those to be perfect. And it means you have to make me happy since that's the bottom line. And if you don't make me happy, then I'm out, you know. And of course, perfect appearance. Um, I don't think, as a friend of mine has said, you know, nobody looks into the mirror and says, finally, <laughs> I'm exactly the way I want to be, right? <laughs> None of us do that. But, uh, you know, it's, if something's too big, we cut it off, too small, you know, we enhance whatever, try to work it out and make, you know, whatever. If you need something else to add onto your life to make you happy, let me just tell you, you're relying on stuff. God does not want you happy when it's based on things, when it's based on things of this world. And by the way, most of us, the way most of us live, we believe that the things of the world will make us happy. I'm not saying you can't enjoy them. In fact, God wants us to enjoy the great things he's given us. But most of us live our lives in a way that says, wow, I need stuff and that stuff will make me happy. When scripture says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, he's not saying don't admire it or don't enjoy its beauty or whatever. He's talking about that philosophy, that way of thinking, that grabbing, 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 getting all you can. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, that's kind of an amazing thing, isn't it? For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and, and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So don't be, don't be fooled. God may bless you with things, and that's wonderful. You know, that's from God. God gives wealth, and he blesses people financially and materially. That's great. Um, he, he doesn't mind you having nice things. That's not the point of this, this saying that. He just doesn't want things to have you, you see? I mean, he, we can have possessions, but he doesn't want those to possess us. And that's the problem that happens. We get our lives wrapped up in it. I, I don't know if you uh, like crab. Um, Cindy and I love crab. And um, when we were in Monterey and Carmel recently, you know, just being able to get fresh seafood was so great. But, you know, w one of the things we don't like, though, is imitation crab. You ever bought imitation crab or gotten something and you thought it was crab, but then it was imitation? I don't know what they put in it, um, but it is very, very odd. They can make it even sometimes look real, but wow, you know, and, and I, don't know, I don't know what's in it, but it's an imitation. It's not the real thing. That to think that the things of the earth, the world, it's just stuff, the more you get, to think that that's going to make you happy is kind of like that. It's an imitation happiness. God doesn't want you happy when it causes you to do something wrong and, and, and unwise. And God doesn't want you to be happy when it's just based on stuff of this world. God doesn't want you happy. He wants something far better for you. And you know what he wants? God wants you blessed. God wants you not, not happy as much as God wants you blessed. In fact, that word blessed in, in the original uh, language is the word makarios, uh, not to be confused with the makarena, which is a dance, right? Um, but that word in, in the Greek, it means supremely blessed. In fact, it means more than happy. God wants you far more than happy. Why? Because just take the word happiness. Happiness is is based on happenings. Any of you right now not having good happenings in your life? Um, I think all of us, you know, would rather not have to, a pandemic and have to wear a mask all the time and all that. We have some happenings. Some of you have some very, very severe, serious, agonizing happenings in your life. If our happiness is based on our happenings, then and our happenings are not always good, then we can't we can't depend on happiness, can we? Blessings are based on far more than happenings. It's something beyond this world. In fact, Psalm 112 verse 1 says, Blessed, more than happy, is the man who fears the Lord. Not more than happy is the one who does whatever they want and you know, or pursues happiness at all costs. No, not, not any of that. Not, not happy is the person who settles for a cheap imitation. <laughs> okay? But it's the one who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. It isn't just happy based on happening. It's more than that. It's more than happiness based on things of the world. 
pastor and, and author, Max Licato, some of you may have heard of him and may read some of the things he said. He shares, he's got a little, a very, very short book, very small book that he wrote and wrote about heaven. But he gives a kind of a funny illustration about us, but he uses a fish to illustrate us and, um, and really talking about happiness and what would make us happy. But he says this, he goes, he says, and I'll read it to you. Take a fish and place him on the beach. Watch his gills gasp and scales dry. Is he happy? No. How do you make him happy? Do you cover him with a mountain of cash? <laughs> do you give him a beach chair and sunglasses? Do you bring him a Playfish magazine and martini? Do you wardrobe him in double-breasted fins and people-skinned shoes? <laughs> of course not. Then, then how do you make him happy? You put him back in his element. You put him back in the water. He will never be happy on the beach simply because he was not made for the beach. And he goes on and he says, and you will never be completely happy on earth simply because you were not made for earth. Oh, you will have moments of joy. You'll catch glimpses of light. You will know moments or even days of peace, but they simply do not compare with the happiness that lies ahead. See, God created you and I for a relationship with him. Not to try and just suck as much happiness out of this life as we possibly can and then, you know, call it quits. It will never bring satisfaction as hard as we try. We will never find happiness in, in things that are temporary. We can't find happiness in putting our life in things that won't outlast our life. So, if I could put it this way, just lower your expectations of earth <laughs> and then you can raise them, uh, you know, your expectations of heaven because it's absolutely wonderful. It, we aren't meant to live an imitation life. See, no new car, no house, no new living room furniture, no you know, kitchen appliance, no new job, no new look, no new spouse, no new baby. No new vacation, no, no new job you fill in, no new income, none of that will ever satisfy because we weren't made for stuff. God wants to give you so much more than happiness, but it's only when we truly believe that we can let go of things, those things that we grab onto and hold onto so tightly. When we realize how much God loves us, and how much he gives us, and how much he wants to bless us, um, I think that's when we'll be able to loosen our grip on what we hold on to so, so harshly, so severely, on things that we know are temporary. And, and the truth is, is we just don't know better. You know, as little babies, we you know, put something on as we grab it. As little kids, we get a toy, and we hang on, and we think, wow. But who is blessed? We talk about being blessed. Who, who's more than happy? Well, let me show you what Jesus did say. And I'm going to read this in, in, as we close in Matthew 5. And by the way, these are some of the verses that the, um, that, that organization I mentioned, you know, the uh, Vote Common Good uh, organization <laughs> used um, out of context and so forth. But uh, anyway, but in Matthew 5, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? For they will be comforted. Some of you right now, you're hurting. You're mourning. But let me remind you that you are blessed of God. You say, why? I'm mourning. I'm hurting. Let me tell you, if you allow God to comfort you, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. If you allow God to comfort you, you are going to learn about God and you're going to have a, a, a closeness with God that you never thought possible. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad 
because great is your reward in heaven. Some of those are so, you know, contrary to what we would think, you know, being insulted, being all of that, you know, persecuted, falsely accused, all of this, all of this evil. You know what Jesus was really, if you go back through those and you really look, you know what Jesus was just outlining? He was outlining his characteristics and he was also letting us know of his experience. Why are we blessed when we're persecuted? If we're persecuted for him, as it says now, if we're persecuted because we're obnoxious, <laughs> that's one thing. But if we're persecuted because we follow him, there again is a fellowship with God himself that is very rare and very wonderful. Rejoice and be glad because he says, great is your reward in heaven. It's not about here. You know, we all live a certain length of time. We're not assured of, of, of any number of years. You know, I hope all of you live a long, healthy life, but we just know we've been around too long to know that that's not always the case. We've been looking COVID in the face for a while, and, and that's also taken people that perhaps even surprised us. So the bad news is this. God doesn't want you happy all the time. <laughs> But here's the good news. The good news is he wants you more than happy. Even in those times when you're mourning, even those times when you're being insulted, even those times when you're going through a really difficult time, God wants you to be blessed. And he wants you to be blessed because we weren't created for what happens to us. You weren't created for what happens to you. You were created for what God wants to do in you, what God wants to do through you, and most of all, what God wants to do for you. In fact, one of those things that God did for you is is what he did 2,000 years ago when he sent his only son, Jesus. Because he loves you, Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again, victorious. The son of God did that so that you could know you are part of God's family, so that you could receive a blessing of knowing you are forgiven that you are free, that you are really free, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let me just tell you, how about eternal life? Eternal spiritual freedom. And pursuit of happiness, oh, we can do better than that. God wants you to have a joy and a peace that no circumstance could ever take away. You know, today, as we close, I want you to, to, to know God loves you and he wants you to be a part of his family. He doesn't force you. But, but he loves you enough that he sent Christ for you. And he died, and he was buried, and he rose again, and you can receive him today. It's really a step of faith. It's really saying, okay, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to pursue my own selfish desires. I'm, I'm going to give my life to you. I'm not going to try and, you know, do my own forgiving. I'm not going to try and make my way to heaven by myself. I'm going to trust you, Jesus. And today, you can take that step. The way I did that was, uh, of course, the decision is you make it in your heart. You make it in your, in your life. And, you, and, and yet I prayed. I prayed a prayer that really expressed that to God. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer that you can pray. And you could pray your own prayer. There's no magical prayer. It's just you expressing, God, I'm giving you my life. I want to be forgiven. I believe Jesus died for me. And I want you to come into my life now. I want to be your child. And if you'd like to pray that, express that to God, just pray it. I'll display it right here on the screen, and I hope that you'll follow along. Dear God, thank you for wanting me to be more than just happy. I ask for the blessing of knowing you personally. Today, I want that assurance and peace that you offer through Jesus. I believe and place my faith in the fact that Jesus died and rose again for me. I ask for your forgiveness for all my sin. Please come into my life and make me your child. I accept you as my Savior today. Help me live for you and thank you for saving me and blessing me with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd love to know if you prayed that prayer just now. And maybe you say, hey, that wasn't the first time I've been praying these prayers all along, but I would love to know about that. If you've got questions, maybe you just say, well, I'm just really not ready to take a step like that, but you'd like some information, I am here for you. So 
message me, you know, contact me some way. You can email me, uh, whatever. I, I really want to be able to be of any help that I can possibly be to you. And um, I just want to say a great big thank you for connecting with me today. And I hope that you are doing well. I want to give you a quick update. Um, you know, the the area has kind of gone up and down, and especially with churches, for a while we've, got, we've gone to the orange, and I think that's technically still our color, and that was going to mean that churches could have 50% of capacity or up to 200 people, whichever was less. So, um, But the truth is, is that they've notified churches that they've had to take a step back, and as well as other groups meetings like that that happen inside. So we are now kind of back to red where it's 25%. And, um, and so, and, but still all of the masks and distancing. And I mention that because I want you to know, we are taking steps to be able to meet back together. Um, so a lot of exciting things are happening in the church. I can hardly wait for you to see what's been going on. And I want you to know your gifts are so appreciated. You can still you know, give through the, the website, you can still give through uh, sending uh, checks if you want through the um, post office box. So if you'd like to, um, the chairs have not come thanks to hurricanes happening in the area where the chairs are manufactured, but uh, they will be coming and we, uh, we're really looking forward to that. So, hey, I just wanted to give you that brief update that we are taking steps. I will keep you informed. All right, so uh, make sure you watch each week and I will let you know when, you know, when things are, are really going to be open and when we have a, a launch of all of us being together. And it'll be weird, you know, we'll be wearing masks and, you know, we'll be you know, standing six feet or more from each other. But hey, we're going to enjoy at least being there with each other, aren't we? I'll tell you, it's going to be great. Hey, I hope you are doing well. I hope you are staying well. And I look forward to connecting with you again online next week. Thanks again for joining me. God bless.